We're going to go, of course, we're looking at Philippians, the book of Philippians, and uh, this is a book of encouragement. Paul's in prison, encouraging the believers at Philippi, Philippi uh, because they're supporting him while he's there. He's, of course, renting a home, trained to Praetorian Guard, and uh, uh, Paul is concerned about them. Why? Because He's concerned they're going to be discouraged by what's happening to him. I think that really shows you the servant's heart. And so Paul gives us that verse that in verse uh, 21 that is so precious. He says, uh, what is that verse again? Say it. Is it up there on the screen? And to die is gain. Right. So that's really a tremendous verse of scripture. And of course that's really, it's my theme verse. The Galatians 2.20 is my life verse, and uh, one I try to emulate. Um, for me to live is Christ, to die is gain, but uh, Paul said it a little differently in Galatians 2.20. Uh, I'm crucified with Christ, and nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me, and the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. If we could understand these concepts and emulate them in our lives. It, it is really two simple verses of scripture which really define the Christian life. Yet they are the most difficult uh, for I find myself failing at them constantly and it breaks my heart when I do. Now, I don't know about you uh, but I don't like to do things over. I like to do things right the first time, right? But simply because you do things right the first time doesn't mean it's not going to have to be done over. I like to do, I like to change the filter on my furnace right the first time when I do it. But I know that it's probably going to be three, four months. I'm going to have to change that thing again. I hate doing it because it's difficult. I've got a system set up where I've made it so it's functional. But it's going to have to be done again. Some of the caulking on my house, I hate to caulk. I don't know about you, but I hate caulking. But I know that it's going to have to be something that's got to be done. And I've got to go do it again. And maintenance is one of those other things. And So much of the work that we do in the church and discipleship is maintenance work. I remember taking a church, um, was quite a large church, and probably half of the church when we went there, and I went as a pastor, I realized very quickly that they were, uh, if they weren't already new evangelical, uh, they were uh, already leaning in that direction. Many of them were. There was social drinking in the church, commonly practiced, and so the issues of holiness and the old banter of judge me not was being introduced and uh, um, all of these issues that I don't want to live by rules, I want to live by grace, but never defining what that means, and, and just all over the place theologically. And it, it was just a battle for three years to get that church turned around. But there was a faction within that church that their favorite hymn was, We Shall Not Be Moved. You know, and they would not be moved. And I've watched that church now. It's been many, many years since we've been there. And I've watched the second and third generations come from that church. And especially the infection that remained in that, in that church because of those that would not be moved. They've lost their kids. And we're seeing uh, another generation coming up into adulthood. Now they're in their mid-20s mid and early 30s that are going back to that same kind of thinking. And my heart just breaks. I was reading something that one of them had posted on Facebook last night at, at 2.30 in the morning because I wasn't able to get to sleep. And so I'm reading this stuff. and I'm just weeping in my heart. I'm just broken about it. And uh, I'm saying, you know, God, I, I must not have done a good job. I must, I must have failed here. But then I realized it wasn't me that failed. It was mom and dad's. These were just babies when I was there. And mom and dad's, even though 
and they had been taught these things, they didn't communicate these things to their children. And when their kids grew up and went to Bible college, they went to the long Bible colleges. And there in the Bible colleges, they were infected with the same kind of postmodern thinking, which is what again? Postmodernism? Accept nothing, question everything. And that is where they are. So discipleship. Discipleship is a battle. And that is where we left off last week. We were looking at the priesthood of the believer in Ephesians chapter 4. We're going to go back there again this morning. Uh, remember there, Paul starts out in chapter 4 with this remarkable statement. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that ye walk worthy. Ye, of course, is all inclusive. It's plural. Ye, the whole church, walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called. This is the election of the believer to the vocational priesthood of all believers. That is what chapters 1 and chapter 2 is dealing about, is that God has chosen them or called them uh, to be priests. It's not salvation, that they're not, not talking about salvation there, election there, but it's election to the priesthood of the believer. And so the concept in this verse of Scripture is that we are to what? Walk worthy of that vocation. Now, anybody who understands the priesthood, the first thing that's going to come into the mind of a priest when he thinks about walking worthy is sanctification. Because he knows that he is walking before God. And so as he walks before God, he understands he must know and have both the heart and mind of Christ. And the only way you're going to get that is from the word of God. The only way you can get the heart and mind of Christ is from the word of God. That's for deism. We'll look at that in a little bit. Now, originally, God wanted Israel to be a nation of priests when they came out of Egypt. And there at Mount Sinai, as the God is first speaking with Moses and with the children of Israel, God said, and ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests, and what? A holy nation. Otherwise, the whole nation of Israel is supposed to be a kingdom of priests. And the children of Israel originally agreed to being God's servant priests to the world. And they said, and all the people answered together and said, all that the Lord has spoken, we will, what? Do. So the rest of Exodus chapter 19 defines then the moral responsibilities of the people to live sanctified lives before God to be enabled to serve as holy, serve a holy God as his priest. That is, that is a whole concept. Now we have almost completely lost the doctrine of sanctification today. The doctrine of sanctification from the concept of being enabled by the Holy Spirit to how to live the Christ life. That's a doctrine of grace. Grace enabling. That's what Paul addresses in Galatians chapter 1 and Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 1, legalism is defined by you having to do something to be saved. You've added to grace uh, works and any kind of works, sacrifices. And then in chapter 3, he says you've added uh, willpower, sanctification, uh, are you now made spiritual by the works of the law? Oh, foolish Galatians. No. Are you now made perfect by the, uh, by the works of the law? Well, of course not. You can't be. That's a ridiculous thought. So both of these two things become a problem in the church. Work salvation, work sanctification. Neither are possible. They're both impossibilities. You can't live the Christ life. It's impossible. That's why Christ said, without me you can do nothing. It's impossible. So we have to find the solution to that in grace, both salvational and sanctificational. So the encounter with God here at Sinai was a fearful occasion for the children of Israel. And it should be a fearful occasion. 
If we're going to have an encounter with God, it ought to be a fearful occasion. Why? Because we are sinners. I, I remember Isaiah's account of God as he sees him in, in chapter 6. He sees God and, and finally he understands. Now he, remember, he's a priest of God or a prophet of God. And he thinks he's probably one of the good guys. We, we all like to think of ourselves that way. But when he finally sees God on his throne, he says, woe is me, I am what? Undone. But everything I thought about who I am and who God is, I, I am undone. I've I've I'm I've come apart. <laughs> no, it's all it's all brought to naught. Why? He says, "For I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell amongst the people of unclean lips." So, as all of the children of Israel heard the voice of God in Exodus chapter nineteen, verse one, speak, what today we call the Ten Commandments, there. This encounter of God was a fearful, fearful occasion. Because now God says, okay, you want to be my priest? Here's my requirements for sanctification. Now that's what the law was. It was sanctificational in nature. Otherwise it defined what was sin for believer priests uh, to live before God. You want to serve me? Okay, here's my expectations of sanctification for you. So Exodus 19, verse 18, look at that verse. And a few of the people, my wife says, no, I, I read that wrong again, honey. What does it say? All of the people saw the thundering and the lightnings and the noise of the trumpet and the mountain smoking. And when the people, again, all the people saw it, they removed and stood afar off. That means they're afraid. They got away from God. <laughs> uh, this is our natural response to God. We want to withdraw. Otherwise, we are fearful of what God should do. But if we really understand God, and we really understand the gift of salvation, we would run to that. And they said unto Moses, Speak thou with us, and we will hear. But let not God speak with us, lest we die. And so here enters in the, in the intermediary work of the priesthood. I said, we don't want to have God speak to us directly. We just want you to speak to us. You know. And Moses said unto the people, Fear not. Just a minute. Fear not, for God has come to prove you. And that his fear may be before your faces that you sin not. Otherwise you would have sanctified the high priest. And the people stood afar off, and Moses grew near under the thick darkness where God was. Moses grew, the people did what? They stood afar off. Okay, Connie? I was just going to say you're in Exodus 20. Yes. Yeah. It's wrong up there? Is it? Oh, I, I see. Uh, I'm not understanding. What's wrong in the script? Oh, okay. I read. Okay, thank you. Exodus 19. Yes. Is it right up on the screen? Oh, I've got Exodus 20 up there. But it's supposed to. Well, I want you to, yeah. I think not. I think that's great. So, what I what you're saying is I have the wrong reference here. It's supposed to be Exodus twenty, eighteen through twenty one. Okay. Well, thank you for that, Connie. And uh, we appreciate us letting you know. Now, you all note that everybody on all of the world, the millions that are watching online, make sure you make that notation. That, that's supposed to be Exodus twenty. So although God wanted Israel to be a nation of priests, the children of Israel reneged on their original agreement with God and God established the Levitical priesthood as part of the Mosaic Covenant. That was an afterthought. 
Now, did God already know that they were going to do that? Well, sure, he did. But it is given to us to show us that when people make agreements, they don't always keep them. And essentially, the connection to water baptism should be an understanding of our commitment to the priesthood of the believer and the living the sanctified life, walking in the newness of life. But we miss that, John. When do you think that the Jews would start to understand all of this stuff? When do they begin? When do they start to understand? Their whole country, their whole group is supposed to be the priests. Well, I think they understood it initially here at Sinai because God had, you know, they had agreed to, right? That is uh, original part of chapter 19 and chapter 20 there. They had agreed to what God had said. But uh, uh, then they they said, no, we, we don't want this anymore. And so they reneged on their, their original acceptance of the Mosaic Covenant, which was originally to be that they all would be priests. Then God uh, originally had chosen the firstborn of Israel to replace uh, you know, to be the priesthood. Then God said, well, I'm going to take the tribe of Levi. And the, if you look in the book of Numbers, the numbers are about the same. He takes the tribe of Levi and they become the priesthood of Israel. So uh, I think now they just say, you know, we don't want to be that. Now, how many people do, we un do, uh, do they understand that water baptism, sanctification of this nature, connects to their priesthood? Not many people do that, Connie. Yeah, I didn't learn that until the last three years. Really, yeah. I knew I was in the priesthood, but I didn't understand the picture of the baptism connection. Yeah, and out of that idea, otherwise, I just assumed that everybody understood this. You know, it's so basic. But uh, and then I come to realize that most Baptists don't. And we are the ones who say that the priesthood of the believer is one of our, car our cardinal doctrines. It's one of our, our uh, you know, it's one of our, our, our major premises of, of Scripture. But we don't. And so then I wrote, are, you, are your baptismal waters doctrinally shallow? Guess who gives me the biggest uh, resistance to that book? Baptists. <laughs> yeah, you would think, because their doctrine of ba the baptism is, is completely wrong too, but uh, uh, I remember a young man we had here wanted to be baptized. I said, well, I won't baptize you because your life is not in alignment with what you say. And he left and went to another church, and within three days, the pastor baptized him. And, and he doesn't go to church at all now anymore. So, John. Well, we read Revelation that says that in those days... Ten men will grab a Jew and say, "Be our priest." Yeah. There's going to be a, a there's going to be an understanding of all this. Yes. For all of Israel. Then. Yeah. I think it'll come to be, of course, in the in the kingdom age, the Jew will come to understand again uh, the priesthood of the of the believer. If you're a born again believer, you're you're a priest before God. And but the Levitical priesthood will still be will be in the millennial kingdom, the saved Levitical priest will be there. And But the priesthood that will rule with Christ is Melchizedekian. So Christ isn't after the tribe of Levi. He is uh, of the Melchizedekian priesthood, Hebrews 5 and Hebrews 7. So the, he the Levitical priesthood by God has been cast off. Not the nation of Israel. The Levitical priesthood has been cast off. And now God is establishing the Melchizedekian priesthood, uh, which, of course, is primarily Gentile in its nature more than it is Jewish in its nature. But I think, you know, there'll be some of that. You know, people are going to come to understand. I think the Jews now understand, not the Jews that are lost, but saved Jews. When they got saved, I think that was a primary issue. Why? Because Peter addresses it in his Jewish epistles. The first and second Peter are primarily Jewish epistles. Uh, Hebrews addresses it certainly. I believe Paul wrote Hebrews, but uh, it certainly addresses the Melchizedekian priesthood of the new covenant. And Jude addresses it to some degree, and, and Christ addresses it 
in his seven epistles, uh, the priesthood of the believer. So I think it's pretty well established in the New Covenant for us to understand. So God did not want Israel to have a king or a priesthood to rule over them because such a system of government would create political and religious classes of people. God says, I don't want that. Otherwise, if you have a king, you're going to have to have an army to defend everything. And look, I'll take care of you. I'll defend you. You don't need to have a king to defend you. And the people said, well, we want a king like all the other nations. And God says, look, he's going to tax you. He's going to take, you, take your men and they have to have armies to defend themselves. But remember, you, t you want a king, you get all the things that accompany that. Otherwise, if you want me to be your king, I'll take care of you. But if you want that, he's going to have to take care of you. And there was an abandonment, some of that. Same is true of the priesthood. You don't, you don't want to have, you don't want to be a priest before me and all the responsibilities of it, then I'll establish a priesthood to rule over you. And that happens as well. So God wanted to speak directly to the children of Israel and directly through the children of Israel to the rest of the world. However, when the children of Israel heard the thunderings and saw the lightnings and heard the noise of the trumpet and saw the mountain smoking, Exodus 19, 8, maybe 20, 18, <laughs> they responded in fear rather than faith. And fearing God's a normal response, especially after understanding the moral responsibilities of being a sanctified servant priest, as detailed in Exodus 1, uh, 19, 1 through 17, and chapter 22 through 20, or verses 22 through 26. So it is to these sanctificational and evangelical responsibilities that Paul speaks in the phrase where he says, I therefore beseech you, in chapter, Ephesians 4.1, that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called. Now you wouldn't understand that phrase at all if you didn't understand what happened back in Exodus chapter 19 and 20. So you should not, I, I expect that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called. You wouldn't understand that if you didn't understand the prophecies of Haggai, Haggai and Malachi. Where God said, I'm going to cast off, the, cast away the children, the priesthood of Israel. And I'm going to bring in a new priesthood. Now that new priesthood is us. So there is an enormous, a great deal, a great deal of theological context to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1. There is an enormous depth here that is often missed because we do not connect it inductively to all of what the other portions of Scripture say about it. So when we talk about servanthood, it is serving God as his believer priest. So when Paul and, and Timotheus say we are servants of the Lord Jesus Christ, they understand that all of the responsibilities that come along with that in sanctification and dependence upon God. Now since most believers begin in theological ignorance, theological training or perfecting must become the priority after the birth of every new local assembly. And these people assemble to be matured in the faith. That's a purpose for the assembly. Now in that assembly, we worship. We praise. But the primary way we worship and the way we praise God is through our own endeavor to be perfected for the work of the ministry. It is the effort in, uh, to which we put, uh, or, uh, in which we put the, uh, our own discipleship, that we are proactive in our own discipleship. Now, it doesn't happen very often today. Now, I, unfortunately, the churches, the doctrine of the church in most churches have been completely corrupted to be evangelistic centers instead of training centers. And that happened back in the early 1900s in the citywide campaigns. And, and uh, now they're uh, gathering all these crowds. And the pastor says, well, let's do that in the church. You just people, you bring all the lost people into the church and, and I'll preach a gospel message and, and then they can get saved. Now, a lot of people got saved there. But the church was transformed into something that it was not intended to be. The church was to be a training center. 
And so when the church then was in the training center, then we had to establish what? Bible colleges. Because you have to have a Bible college because the church can't do its job anymore. So And people aren't interested. You know, only a few people are interested in actually being trained. And that's, that is connected to so many things. So all of this has been so greatly corrupted. Where do we begin? Well, I don't know where everybody else is going to begin. I'm going to begin right here. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to make Shepherd Fold Baptist Church what it should be. Brian. Do you think if churches would have done what they're supposed to do, Bible colleges would have never taken place? I think that, yeah, I, I don't think there was any need for Bible colleges if churches were to do what they actually were organized to do. And the Sunday school would have become what it should have been. But another problem was the home. Homes weren't what they were supposed to be. You know, the principle of scripture is that the pastor trains the father who trains his family, primarily his, his wife and his children. We find that over and over again in the scripture. But we don't have that going on. So what used to be the time of devotion for the family where dad sat around the kitchen table and taught his children the word of God, that doesn't happen much. You maybe read a few verses of scripture, but the teaching of the word of God or the whole principle of discipline then, uh, in, in the scriptures was uh, that, as we'll look in Deuteronomy chapter, chapter 6 and 4, was there. Connie? long ago and there was a lot, many um, preachers that um, did not have a college degree or anything. Mm -hmm. It was all learned in the church. Or, you know, yeah. them. Imagine what it would be like if every preacher had been trained in his local church and pastors were called out of that local church who had trained them. And then every person in the church was trained as well as the pastor was trained. And out of that, you get a dynamic. And so everybody's perfected for the work of the ministry. Now think of how that changes the church. Remember I talked about coming from a family of 16 children and the older children taught the younger children. and That dynamic takes place. That's the way the church is designed to be. So you, Exactly, yes. And we don't have that even going on today. We don't have that going on today. So it's... it's Quite frankly, we've created a mess. Now, we, we can't fix the world's mess, but what we can do is fix the mess that Shepherd Fall Baptist Church, and we should admit that every church is a mess, right? Because why is it a mess? Well, first of all, I'm, I'm, a, I'm part of Shepherd Fall Baptist Church, and I'm a mess, right? So, and when you come in, you add to the mess, right? So every single one of us are struggling in this dynamic of being what we are supposed to be as, as uh, believers in Jesus Christ and and helping one another, not sitting around saying, well, yeah, we'll look at that, we'll get that later. We're, we're trying to help one another become what we ought to be. And we ought to be open to that help and encouragement. Or someone saying to me, yeah, I see that that person is struggling with that. Maybe I can help them with that. And go with them and say, you know, maybe I can help you with this. Here's something I struggle with. Maybe I can help you with this. And that person is actually open to that. <laughs> Wouldn't that be a wonderful dynamic? <laughs> well, you could come to me and you say, Pastor, I heard you say this, and I'm really struggling with what you said, and I don't really understand. And, and, uh, but here's what I think about it. And I'd say, wow, that's nice. I'm open to that. Let's have that conversation. That's wonderful. That's the way it ought to be. Daniel. Tremendous principle. Uh, I've, uh, I've, I've spoken on that many times over the years. So the, since most believers, as we've said, begin in theological ignorance, 
Uh, theological training must become the priority after the birth of every new assembly and every new Christian. So these people assemble to be matured in the faith. Now that purpose must be explained. Now when you joined a church, how many of you were told that is the purpose of, of this church? That's why we exist. We're here to make you a disciple. But we can't make you a disciple unless you work with us. And therefore, by you are joining with us, you are joining into that dynamic. You are going to be proactive in your own discipleship. You're going to want to hear what God has to say to you. You're going to want to have the Bible explained to you. You're going to want to read the scripture devotionally. <laughs> you see how that changes the dynamic of the church? So secondly, that purpose must be retained then for every new believer born again and added to the assembly. So you've got a group of people that come in. Everybody understands this. That's what the church is for. But now you have a new believer come in. And that focus has to be explained. Okay, you want to be part of Shepherd's Fold Baptist Church? Here's why we exist. We want to perfect you for the work of the ministry. And there are some, therefore, some expectations of you. Our purpose is, as we'll look at the five solas later in, in this lesson, our purpose is these five solas. Sola Scriptura, uh, sola by faith alone, grace alone, faith uh, uh, glory, to glo God's glory alone, the five, the five solas, we'll look at them in a while. But um, if you lose that focus and, and the potential for the continuity of any local church will end with that loss. Otherwise, that church at that point now, it moves up to this pinnacle, and then it begins to decline. And so therefore, God has ordained pastors, missionaries, evangelists for local church leadership, and these gifted men bring this focus with them to the new local assembly. But you can't have any pastor that doesn't come with that focus. If he doesn't come with that focus, don't call him as your pastor. If he doesn't come with that as a directive, or any evangelist who's going to speak, but that's not his directive, then, then we've lost the purpose of why the church exists. Now, this is the purpose for which God ordained these positions. And this is what God provided in his answer to the prayer of the man of Macedonia, who prayed saying, come over into Macedonia and what? And help us. In other words, perfecting the saints for the work of the ministry is God's objective in providing the gifted men to a local church. God wanted a theocracy, not a theonomy. A theocracy is God ruling directly. A theonomy is God ruling through the Levitical priesthood or through kings. Later, the children of Israel would even demand a king like all the other nations, Deuteronomy 17, 14. And the government of the church would reestablish a degree of theocracy where God could speak directly to his people through his word. Now, there would be a mouthpiece. Now, you don't need me, right? God has ordained that he have pastors, but you can learn the scriptures by yourself. But I have found out that in most cases, uh, that can be a difficult thing if you're not dependent upon the Spirit of God. Otherwise, you need somebody to give you the five souls. So we have Ephesians 4, 11 through 16. Now, we've read this many, many times before. Verse 11, he says, he gave apostles, some prophets, of course, those that passed away. Today, we have evangelists and pastor teachers in the church. Why did he give them? For the reason he gave them is for the perfecting, this is equipping, maturing of the saints for the work of the ministry. Otherwise, this is why these fours are built one upon the other. He's given the pastors for the purpose of it perfecting the saints. Why do we perfect the saints? For the work of the ministry. Why do we perfect them for the work of the ministry? Why? For the edifying, the building up of the body of Christ. Where does church growth come from? That's when the saints are perfected for the work of the ministry. And how long is this to take place? Until we all come in the unity of the faith. 
You just keep at it. You keep plugging away at it. Uh, and uh, of the knowledge, intimate relational knowledge of the Son of God. Otherwise, you keep at it till you enter into this epigenosis knowledge of Jesus Christ. Not just intellectual knowledge, just relational knowledge. Unto a perfect man, that's a mature, equipped man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, and uh, that we henceforth be no more children, what were they if they were, if this is what henceforth means? Otherwise, down the road that we aren't going to be tossed about, uh, tossed to and fro and carried about with there by every wind of doctrine. What is he saying? This is what you are now. But once you've been perfected, you, this won't happen again. And of course, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. Verse 15, but speaking the truth and love may grow up in, into him in all things. Otherwise, the body, as a child, child's body becomes in proportion to the adult head of Jesus Christ. And then by which, uh, uh, fitly joined and compacted by, by that which every joint, that's every single one of us in the body supplieth according to the effectual working in the measure of every part. If every part's not perfected of the body, uh, the body's not going to function. It will be crippled to that degree. So now let's see if we just take the next 15 minutes and look at the five solas. We'll see if we can get through these this morning. I don't know if we can. But there are five truths that must be understood before any believer priest can be perfected for the work of the ministry. Now we gather these inductively. Otherwise... We have to look at a great deal of scripture to get all of these there, but they are, the scriptures are redundant with these five solas. So these five truths are known as the five solas. It's, it's not enough just to remember what they are. We must understand their individual significance to what defines the faith. Now the faith, the, the word for the faith is fideism. Uh, don't get scared by that word. It's a big word, but it's not really big. It's only got so many letters in it. Uh, the, the point is, uh, it's a word that's very important. What is fideism? Well, the basic meaning of fideism is that our beliefs, the faith, come solely from the inspired words of God without being infected by rationalism or humanism or human reason. I say, well, that sounds simple. Yeah, try it. That's where the battle is, of, of, really. I had a young man who quoted some guy on the Internet. and uh, I said, well, you put this all in quotes. Who are you quoting? And, and he gave me the name, Scott, name of the guy. And I know that this guy has been very critical of Fideism because he's a philosopher and he teaches. Uh, he's a seminary professor, but he's <clears throat> very critical of Fideism. Because philosophy likes to interject rationalism and reason. By the way, that is where liberalism entered into, into Christianity. By introducing rationalism and reason and giving it more and more prominence in establishing the faith. <clears throat> so this sounds simple enough, but it's not. Connie. They like to convert the because the ISM is pertaining to Fide, fide means faith. Okay. Sola, sola fide, we'll see later on, just faith alone. So fide, fide means faith. So we're looking at that as what defines the faith. So the faith, we get our faith, we get the faith just from the Bible alone. And otherwise we get it out of the Bible. That big word for that is exegesis. Remember, we get it out from. So we just get our faith out from the Bible. We don't read into the Bible our rationalism or reason. And that's another problem altogether. But <clears throat> uh, So this sounds simple, but we're infected with a sinful nature that naturally rationalizes and reasons away the faith. We can we'll all begin in ignorance. <clears throat> but the faith is defined by the inspired words of God. So every generation of new Christians must be diligent in establishing and understanding the five solas before they will ever be perfected for the work of the ministry. Okay, what's the first one? Sola Scriptura. What does that mean? It's the Bible alone. 
I don't need to read the philosophers. I don't need to read Aristotle and, and uh, Plato and Socrates and and uh, uh, other philosophers, which are so-called Christian philosophers. Is Saint Augustus, Calvin, Luther, all are philosophical, intermixing Aristotle and syllogism uh, into their scripture uh, analysis, and therefore they corrupt it. Uh, this was the foundation of classical education. Classical education introduced this idea of rationalism and reason into theism and corrupted it and, and thereby stole it. So this sola, sola scriptura, is reflected in most fundamental doctrinal statements as we believe the Bible is the sole authority for life and its practices and the Bible must be rightly divided, exegesis, before the faith can be established in everyone's, anyone's life. So, Braden, if we're going to have rightly divided, what do we need? We need the Bible, we need to read it, and we need to understand hermeneutics. Right? Otherwise, how do we interpret it? And those are some basic rules as well. Number two, sola gratia. means salvation and sanctification are accomplished by grace alone. Now, this is not the sovereign grace concept of, of this. That's false doctrine. Because although there is free will involved in decisions to exercise faith in what God says to do and being born again, we find that in Romans chapter 10, 1 through 13. Every one of those, there's five decisions there in that portion of Scripture. Every aspect of the new birth is accomplished by the Spirit of God in the believer's new creation. His sin nature is already spiritually crucified with Christ. He is already buried with Christ. He's already risen with Christ. He is already seated with Christ at the right hand of the Father. Most of that you can find in Colossians chapter 2. Secondly, living the sanctified life is solely by grace. Through yielding, Romans chapter 6, uh, 11 through 13, to the enabling of the enabling Holy Spirit of Christ who then lives his life through the believer's life. But it is a synergism, a partnership with the believer. So that's sola gratia. Sola fide means through faith alone. Simple. You don't need to be explained anymore. Faith is believing the word of God. Faith isn't just believing something that you can't see. No, faith is founded in the word of God. Faith is not a blind leap into the darkness. Faith is an informed uh, leap into the light. And that is what we do when we study the Word of God. So I accept the Bible as the Word of God, not autopisticism, and therefore I take a leap into the light. Sola Christus means the new uh, means the new life is solely about Christ. That's what Paul is talking about in Galatians two twenty and Philippians uh, one twenty one. Uh, for me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. Sola Christus. Otherwise, it's all about Christ. And then the last one is one we often forget and as, as we slip up on considerably. And when I say we, I mean me as well. <laughs> and that's sola dea gloria. It means that Christ's life is lived to be, his life is to be lived to the glory of God alone. Not to my glory. Not to my building a name for myself. <laughs> but we all need validation and we all want it so badly. But I tell you, if that's what you are working for, you will be very quickly slip into compromise because you'll want people's validation more than you want God's. And so it must be to the glory of God alone, Brian. I am highly confident that an individual tries to make a name for themselves and they're born again. God will chasten them. They will go through hardship and they will learn to not have that attitude. And, I don't know, sometimes the people that seek the big name and get it have a hard time believing they're saved. I think that's sometimes true, but it's so easy for any of us to slip. And so I regularly put checks in my life. So I regularly ask myself that question. If, if what I'm doing to, doing to the glory of God, especially when I get discouraged. And I don't know about you, you probably never get discouraged. But uh, I get discouraged often. And so when I get start getting discouraged, one of the first things I ask myself, 
Are you doing this for your glory or for the glory of God? And therefore, if I'm being faithful, I know I can do it to the glory of God. And it doesn't make any difference about whether I'm getting any glory for it. Because I know the opposite is going to be true. If I'm being faithful, I'll be persecuted for my faithfulness. I'll be more hated for it and rejected for it than I am going to be accepted for it. And that's the pattern we find for Scripture. So I, I, I find that often and uh, uh, to be, be the problem. Uh, it, it's, it's amazing. Okay, let's just take a time of discussion about these um, for a moment. Anybody have a question or a thought about this? Karen? Why is it spelled S-O-L-I in number five? Is it like singular to plural or something? Or? Uh, sola is, is one alone. Soli means a little bit, uh, a little bit different. Uh, uh, <coughs> but it's Latin, and I, I don't know Latin. I hope I can. I'm sorry I can't answer your question. My ignorance came forth there. Thank you for exposing that, Karen. <laughs> Speaking of validation, wouldn't, wouldn't you say that, I mean, we, we kind of see this in like any aspect of life, how, how we are as human beings and sinners before God, but um, it's because of our pride we seek that validation first. Why do we go to God? Are we seeking validation of Catholic or whatever that is, and I said, "Well, um, isn't your? Do you have the? You believe in the Bible?" And I said, they said "Well, sure, I believe in the Bible." And I said, "Well, then it's your job to convince me that you're right." Go ahead, I'm ready. Now they don't want to do that, right? They don't want to do that. They don't want to talk about that at their doorstep. But I'm always, I'm always ready to listen. I said, "Well, tell, tell me, what, do I, what must I do to be saved?" And uh, to ask that question to them and then let them go ahead and tell me. That's your job. Now you tell me, convince me. Could bring me to the faith that you believe is what necessary to be saved. And then I'll just answer when they make those statements through scripture and quote scripture. So, uh, you know, these, these things are so important. Now, I don't want you to get hooked up on the Latin here. Okay, forget the Latin. Bible alone, Greece alone, faith alone, Christ alone, to the glory of God alone. So these are things that we should anchor ourselves to. We can all remember those things. Why do I live? I live to the glory of God. Everything, if I get up every day with that focus in mind, everything that I want to do today is to, to bring God glory. And to help someone. So as I was thinking about these young people today that I was talking about earlier, this young seminary student who was about three, five, maybe four years old when I was the pastor of his mom and dad. And now he's going to a reformed seminary and learning all kinds of stuff, reading all kinds of stuff that he's not ready to read. 
Uh, and I, I, I said, how can I help this young man? Do I just, you know, it's not going to help me to come down on him like a ton of bricks. Say, well, you stupid fools. What are you talking about, you know? No, I've got to come and make an approach to them that they will listen to what I have to say and ask them these questions of, you know, uh, what are these things? What, what are these important things? The faith. What is the faith? What, what does faith alone mean? Um, where do you get your doctrine? Where, where do you get the things you, you know, that you say you believe? Are you getting that from rationalism or reason? Or can you find in the Bible where, you, where those truths are sourced? This is what we have to do. And we have to have this engagement, not, not always with lost people. In fact, today, the biggest form of ministry we have is with people who profess to be believers in Jesus Christ, who have been led down a pathway that is completely foreign to all of these things. And we have to be ready to engage them. Many times our own children and grandchildren. I know I have these conversations with my grandchildren. And it's not just me coming forth as being the one who says, well, look, I'm 50. I've been in the ministry 50 years. And, you know, you don't know what you're talking about. And No, I have to, I have to approach them just as if they're my, my equal. And many times, not from up here, but from down here. And make an appeal to them uh, to rethink what they're doing and where they're going, and that's it's just just breaks your heart. Just breaks your heart. I, I weep about these things. Uh, feel like crying about it right now. You just get so broken inside. But uh, you know, some people you're not going to be able to help, but that doesn't doesn't mean you don't try, right? Amen. Braden, you, oh wait, John, you got one more question. I like it because I, I know you know full well that everybody has their own free will. We can have all the right motivation and right words and sentences and all that stuff. Really want the best for them, for them to get saved and live right, but they still got to make their own mind. That's right. Everybody gets choice. That's individual soul liberty, really. Everybody gets to make their own choice. Everybody accepts the consequences of those choices, right or wrong. That's the way it is. And we can't force feed anybody. It doesn't work that way. Okay, Brandon, would you close us in prayer, please? Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this opportunity to learn and to grow. I ask that we would meditate upon these uh, truths and that this lesson would grow in our hearts all week long. Help us to seek your will and to follow after that which you've given us.